It's my pleasure to invite up our speaker this evening, our executive director, Jeremy Regent. And it's nice to see your parents joining you here as well. You got the cheering section ready to go. Um, as hopefully you know by now, Jeremy Regent joined our team in December and has just hit the ground running. Um, truly a mensch with an eye for logistics. It's a wonderful combination um, and has kept this place running smoothly since December. Keep going. I'll, I'll... Um, so we thought it would be nice to sort of have him uh, check in. No, I'm done. I'm done. That's all. Um, it's only been eight months. I mean, okay. um, we thought it'd be nice kind of eight months in just, just hear from him uh, to hear how things are going. Um, this is going to be kind of just, he's going to read his to-do list for the next 10 minutes, um, I think is, is what we agreed upon. Um, and, and we limited him to 10 minutes. So, um, But in all seriousness, it's been such a joy to welcome you to our staff. Um, also a wonderful opportunity, if you haven't met Jeremy yet, to put a face with the name um, as well. And you'll have a chance to come up and say hello to him after our Shabbat service as well. So Jeremy, welcome to our Bima. Thank you, Rabbi Heath. Okay, we're gonna okay there. Ooh. Oh, wow. Um, so what Rabbi Heath didn't say is that my parents surprised me by coming today. So that's very special. And you know, they're my oldest relationship <laughs> possible. But I look out at you all, and maybe even people streaming, that um, there's some really wonderful new relationships out here, too, about which I'm very, very happy um, that it's growing like this. So it's been great so far. So Shabbat Shalom. This week, we read a double parsha, Matot Mase. And in my mind, one of the ways I think about the different portions of the Torah is the spectrum. And on the one hand, you have a very dry, legalistic sleep aid. And <laughs> that, that's just me. And then on the other hand, you have, uh, this, you have this maybe like an explicit, violent TV spinoff for Game of Thrones. <laughs> and friends, I've got good news. Winter is coming. That was a Game of Thrones reference. Not very much. Now I know who watches. Very good. OK. So what's happening in this Parsha? The Jewish people continue their sojourn through the wilderness, continuously interacting with and being harassed by the various tribes who live nearby. Moses makes clear that God expects strict non-fraternization with their temporary neighbors. And conflict comes to a head with the Midianites who are led by the evil mastermind, Balaam. It is an ugly story. Balaam schemes to send out his daughters to seduce the men of Israel, destabilizing the family unit and making the Jews vulnerable to attack. Moses responds by organizing a brutal war campaign and ordering the killing of all the captives. If you're squirming in your seat hearing me summarize this, then you are in good company. For centuries, rabbinic commentators have attempted to explain, legally isolate, and limit the permissibility of this kind of violence. We read long Talmudic conversations about the differences between murder and killing, and the narrow permissibility of punitive or preemptive violence. And particularly in light of the recent developments of the targeted killings of, of Hamas and Hezbollah leaders, there's a rich discussion to be had here. But I want to do something else. I want to share another take on this topic that I learned from Rabbi Mark Borowitz. While studying at Hebrew Union College in LA, my classmates and I visited Rabbi Borowitz's community and, and organization, Beit Tshuva. As we're approaching the high holidays, you may recognize the word tshuva, tshuva as repentance or return to our true selves. Beit Tshuva is the house of return, its mission is to heal broken souls and save the lives of those wrestling with addiction by providing integrated care in a community setting. Walking through the doors of Beit Shuva for Shabbat services led by community members in recovery, I didn't know what to expect. I certainly didn't expect a six-piece band of talented musicians playing exciting modern renditions of Shabbat standards and a deep spiritual investment in welcoming Shabbat as a time for rest and connection. The prayer service crescendoed to a spiritual peak at Rabbi Borovitz's Dvar Torah. Coincidentally, he talked about this very parsha and the one from last week, Pinchas. Last week, to remind you as a refresher, we read the story of Pinchas, who stumbled upon an Israelite man named Zimri, 
we'll say fraternizing with Cosby, a Midianite woman, and Pinchas is overcome by rage and zealousness and kills them both with one thrust of his spear. Rabbi Borovitz's important teaching on that story was this. Eventually, the Jewish people needed to decide who will be responsible for administering the burnt animal sacrifices on the altar, a carefully prescribed process that involved ritually killing the animals. The likeliest candidates would have been Aaron or his immediate family, who were already designated as priests. However, God didn't do that. Instead, God remembered Pinchas' stabbing of Zimri and Cosby, elevated him to the priesthood, and put him in charge of administering the sacrifices, the, the sacred stabbing. So what God did is God gave Pinchas a holy framework for his deepest inclinations. And according to Rabbi Borovitz, his work building a vibrant, connected Jewish community was predicated on helping people find a Jewish frame for their existing passions. And to see this, all I had to do was look to the band of musicians passionately playing Shabbat melodies, many of whom I later learned were pros in the LA music scene, an environment unkind to people struggling with addiction. His teaching has stayed with me all these years because it resonates so deeply with my own approach to building community. I also believe it is true for all of us. Let me share an example. When I worked on campus with Hillel at Stanford, I had a student, Daniel, who had eclectic interests and a very quirky sense of humor. He did things like super glue a brown curly wig to a bike helmet and ride it around campus all year. He called his creation the Hair Met and tried to get others to join his Bob Ross biker gang to promote helmet safety. You'll be shocked to learn the campaign didn't take off. It took a few years of talking, but we eventually found Daniel's Jewish frame. He was also one of the project leads of the Stanford Space Initiative and worked on their rocket launches. Over coffee, we came up with an idea of combining his next rocket launch with the Rosh Hashanah folk custom Tashlich, where we cast bread into water to, embodying, to embody letting go of our year's shortcomings. We called it Tashlich in Space. People filled out this form with reflections and hopes for the year, and we downloaded it into a little storage card, put on a rocket, and we blasted it off. And if you Google Tashlich in space, you can read about it in the J. So this project was the beginning of a long path of meaning and connection for Daniel. He had found his Jewish frame. What I'm telling you is you don't need a space lab to find yours. Take a moment and think about what matters to you. If I were to open up your calendar, what would I see? What keeps you up at night? And what gets you out of bed in the morning? I'd be willing to wager there is something already here that touches upon your passions and commitments right here at Betham. So is it intellectual curiosity and learning? Is it becoming a better family member, climate justice, social justice, spirituality and prayer, drama and film, family, education, art, music, cooking, interfaith work, deepening relationships with Israel or Jews around the world, making friends, staying active, promoting democratic participation, traveling, nature, making parenting easier, visiting the sick or, or mourning. There are Jewish frames for all these and more right here. I know this is true because I see the work of our many leaders and of the volunteers who are organizing something like a, a directory of the many dozens of active groups here at Beth Am. It's called the Beth Am Groups Group, or the bag. <laughs> you have to say it with that voice, too. The breadth of opportunities reflects decades of work from our members, from staff and clergy, building Jewish frames around congregant passions. And while each group is in varied stages of development, they all have something in common. They thrive when you take a little risk, make space in your busy schedules, and show up. The bag is continuing its work in the coming months, but in the meantime, please work up a little courage as you read your Beth Am newsletters and circle a few events or groups that seem like they align with your passions. If you have a feeling 
that nothing offered here speaks to your values or passions, then I am extremely interested in speaking with you. And I know the same is true for any of our clergy or educators. Please come find me and let's talk about what's possible. Last month, Rabbi Nemetov told us the Hasidic folktale about the new synagogue built without lights, but with many empty light stands. The synagogue was only fully lit when each member showed up with their own light to share. And I loved his telling of that story and his invitation to each of us to show up with our light. To his encouragement, I'm adding the notion that Beth Am has a Jewish frame for you and a group of people who are missing you and they don't even know it yet. And I want to end with a Shabbat blessing. May we all bring our whole selves to Beth Am and find deep meaning and connection here with one another. May we find and share the Jewish frame. Shabbat Shalom.